This is the United States Energy Association Power Sector Podcast. I'm your host, Herman K. Trabish. I've covered the power sector since 2006, and I currently report for Utility Dive. My guest today is Alliance for Transportation Electrification Executive Director Phil Jones, a former Washington State Utilities Commissioner and a former president of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. And while brutality continues in Ukraine, Israel, and the Republican Caucus of the House of Representatives, we are going to talk about how to meet the growing U.S. need for public electric vehicle charging. Phil, a June 2023 DOE study called U.S. Transportation Electrification Ambitions unprecedented in the history of the automotive industry and said it's going to take 182,000 publicly accessible fast charging ports to support a projected 33 million EVs at a cost of $27 billion to $44 billion. That is a lot of chargers to deploy and a lot of money to find. Even with 2022's Inflation Reduction Act and 2021's Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, now, utilities and charger providers agree DOE's projections are accurate, but they do not agree on how to achieve them. So tell us, how significant is the urgency of EV charger deployment right now, and where do chargers need to be built? So the NREL study that you cite, uh, Herman, is a very good study. It's uh, It was years in the, well, not years in the making, but it was vetted by a lot of my colleagues and different people. So the numbers are pretty accurate. The range of investment, 27 to 44 billion. I've seen higher numbers from Atlas Public Policy and, and some others, but it's generally on target. So if you talk to people about the two or three major issues holding back uh, our our transformation of the sector, uh, the biggest one, well, the first one is the cars are still too expensive, right? Before the tax credits. So we need tax credits, both federal and state to try to equalize that, even though the costs of the vehicles are coming down in spite of inflation and, and as you cite the Ukraine and COVID. But the other major thing is charging or range anxiety. So there are two issues there. There aren't enough of them in all the areas where we need them. And second is the reliability hasn't been what we thought it was going to be. So the worst thing that could happen, right, is that somebody buys an EV, they're all excited, they drive up to a 50 kW DC fast charging station, and it doesn't work. And so that to me means that that person could get so dissatisfied with the EV experience that they go back to an internal combustion engine and start burning gasoline and diesel. So there are a lot of anecdotes with that. Uh, Plug in America recent, recently published a survey uh, for last year that said that both for Tesla superchargers to a lesser extent, and then for the non-Tesla public network, the reliability had degraded quite a bit. Now, some of this is due to uh, increased adoption, more people are using, there's queuing, there's congestion, but some of it is just due to old fashioned engineering and trying to get out the bugs, components. So yeah, it's a problem of reliability and we can talk about where the chargers go, but my view is the chargers need to go everywhere. So that means low, moderate income neighborhoods, uh, underserved areas, uh, people who were disadvantaged by the interstate highway system when it was built, those communities tend to be black, African-American, Hispanic, they tend to be in, in uh, underserved areas and in, in metropolitan areas. But let's let's not forget about the rural areas too. We have tremendous, America is a huge continental country as opposed to Japan, Korea, and Europe where it's easier to deploy all this infrastructure. So we have huge expanses of middle America where we can have charging deserts, we call them, where there's no charger and that's not good for anybody. So. There are a number of use cases here, and we can argue about whether the utility should provide the private sector or a local government, but there's a whole range of options. But yeah, we need chargers everywhere. But in my view, it's not a gas station experience, right? So the gas station mm -hmm. means you have to go to the gas station to fill up. 
it's controlled by convenience stores. It's a very concentrated market. Some say competitive, some say not competitive. But with electric vehicle charging, the owner of the vehicle controls a lot more, right? So you can charge 80% of the time at home with a level two charger. But, um, and, and a lot of people really like that experience of controlling your charging at home. You don't have to go to a gas station uh, and, anymore. But as I said, once you start traveling around and you have longer distances, this public charging becomes really, really important to solve this uh, issue of range anxiety, we call it. Okay, um, and, and I know that you have advocated um, publicly and frequently for a larger role for utilities in providing that, uh, that public charging that in, and helping meet that need. Now, utilities like Rocky Mountain Power in Utah and APS in Arizona have partnered with Electrify America's subsidiary, Electrify Commercial. Uh, Electrify America is one of the U.S.'s biggest private charger builders, and they are providing chargers through the utilities. On the other hand, Southern California Edison and National Grid New York are focusing on building only the make readies, the hardware up to the charger, and leaving the charger to private sector providers. The private charger provider charge point, which is another major factor in this uh, in this rollout, recently told me the utility's best role is upgrading distribution system infrastructure up to the make ready and leaving the rest for the uh, private companies. Should chargers be left to the private sector or should utilities have a role? Well, we think and I think that the, the markets can coexist with each other, that the utility can be an enabler of the market and make ready is a very good option. About two thirds of my utility members, Herman, prefer kind of a make ready model, building up to the meter or even beyond the meter uh, to provide that conduit and, and the switch gear and the transformer uh, to do that. But a third of my members, I, I'd say roughly a quarter to a third, prefer to have at least the option of providing uh, either on a turnkey basis or themselves uh, providing that option. Why? Because utilities, uh, they, we think, and I think, you, utilities can do this well. They can enable the market in this early stage. We really don't know what the business model for charging is going to look like 10, 15 years from now. Right now, it's a very difficult model. So obviously, ChargePoint likes a subsidy or likes a cost shift because that's what happens with these utility programs approved by the commissions is that the utility will provide infrastructure and maybe a rebate for the charger, $500, $400 for the charger itself to goose the market. And so that money goes to the private sector. So this is really not a private sector versus utility type of market. It's not a black and white. I mean, as you know, you've been covering the industry for years. Rate making by itself is a, it's an art. It's not a science, and there's a lot of stuff in rates and programs that shift costs around for public purposes. So we believe that the two can coexist, but as I said, my members, my utility members, some prefer uh, make ready. Now, two other options is that Rocky Mountain Power option, which we see uh, increasing. That's called turnkey, right? So a private sector company like Shell Recharge, Flow, whatever can work for a utility, build out the infrastructure, operate the charger, run the network, and the utility is, is responsible overall to the commission. And then they're allowed to put that in rate base or a regulatory asset and, and get a return on that. Another option that has increased recently is subscription with a lease. So this is an option where time starved consumers, you know, people are very starved for time, they don't understand utility rates. What's a demand charge? What's a time of use rate? And so some utilities like Duke and Excel are offering subscription rates where you get for 25 bucks a month, you get about 850 kilowatt hours and you get a charger, but the, but the utility owns the charger and leases it back to the consumer, either residential or commercial for 10 years. And then at the end of that period, that charger goes to the consumer. So that's another possible business model, Herman. So 
I guess my point is that we have, you know, we're in the early stages. A lot of things are being tried and we don't know how it's going to work out at the end of the day. Yeah, um, I, we just had Duke Energy, a Duke Energy Vice President Lon Huber on earlier in the week uh, to the podcast, and he talked about the subscription model. And of course, it simplifies things. It's different. But um, and the key observation to be made really is that this is very early days for transportation electrification entirely. And yep. uh, there there are people that really don't want to see utilities uh taking advantage of this uh, market uh, they are concerned about the cost shift that you described uh, they say that utilities also have a competitive advantage because they can recover costs uh, through rates and that will allow them to do things in a less efficient way and it's also a less familiar way they want the uh, they want to sustain the gas station type model uh, do you think that the utilities are going to be inclined because of being able to leverage costs uh, recovered through rates to, to put uh, charging stations in less uh, less valuable locations or take other shortcuts? No, I don't. Um, you know, I'll be candid with you and say that utilities are not known as being the fastest moving creatures in the energy network. As you know, Herman, sometimes they're slow. They're cautious. Why are they cautious? Is It's because they have governing bodies or commissions overseeing every little detail of their management. So by nature, they're more conservative. The private sector is nimbler, faster, should be more competitive, right? And and so um, I think there are advantages to both models, but the interesting, the thing I like about the utility model is they should have a lower cost of capital. They should take a longer term view because they naturally do. Many of these uh, uh, charging companies are funded by IPOs they took advantage of the special purpose acquisition company boom, which worked out well for some of them, but for many of them, it didn't. But anyway, their investment horizon is more like five, six years instead of a utility being 10, 15, 20 years. So all of those, and then the universal service obligation, the fact that utilities have to serve all communities. So what the private companies have done over the past 10 years the charging companies, if they they picked out those upper income, middle income locations, think Whole Foods, think Starbucks, think uh, upper end uh, shopping centers. That's where they have gone, right? And installed both DC fast charging and level twos. But what the utilities can do, like I just came from a conference in in Washington at EEI, and we heard from Entergy. What Energy has done with the city of New Orleans is deployed level two chargers all across New Orleans, meaning low income neighborhoods, underserved communities, churches, African American uh, community centers, you know, and that's probably where the private sector is not going to go. So, so as I said, I think there's a role for both, but I think the uh, you know, I was a commissioner for 12 years, did a lot of work on telecom and we called it cherry picking when the industry deregulated. So the CLEX, the competitive companies, went out and they picked the most lucrative, in their view, um, opportunities to for competitive telecommunications. We call that cherry picking. So the same thing has happened, I think, in this industry. And I don't have a problem with that because that's capitalism, that's the market. But uh, my belief is that EVs are becoming so important. It's like broadband. So broadband services, everybody needs it. And in the future, everybody is, is going to have an EV, almost everybody, and everybody is going to need to charge anywhere. So the utilities uh, can play a very important role there. Right. Um, and and it, it, like you say, you've said several times, this is very early days and their business models are still evolving. This subscription thing is coming up. Uh, it's pretty new. Um, there is one, it, it's, it may not be that private ch charger providers uh, can deploy things better or that they are better at maintenance, but that it, there is a, an, a growing facility in all these sites and in all these tasks, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yes, there is. And Herman, I don't know who's better at maintenance, if it's the private sector or the utility. 
Um, it is a tough thing to do, especially uh, Tesla, for example, had the advantage of being totally vertically integrated, right? They built the vehicle, the mm -hmm. software, they built everything, the network. It's a proprietary system, all the software and everything. And so it just works for their vehicles. And that's an advantage. But when you think about Electrify America, ChargePoint, Flow, EV Connect, these charging providers, they, they, they're going to have to work with 50, 60, 70 different uh, auto companies. And guess what? They all have their own software. And they've had a problem. Many of them are having challenges getting their own software to work on the battery management system, the infotainment system, all these things in the vehicle. And then you have to do a handshake with a charger and operate a, and, and connect in a network. And all that has to work seamlessly, right? And so some people liken this to the credit card industry or the ATM in the early days. You know, you could only go to one bank and one bank, and you couldn't use a, a card in another bank. Well, the same thing has to happen in this industry. It has to be interoperable, and you have to develop both protocols, communication, and standards so everything works together. And what we found, and I say this in total honesty, is, is what we found in the non-Tesla world that bringing out all, all these new vehicles and then bringing all these chargers because of government pressures and whatever, um, we we may have done it a little too quickly, and we overlooked the quality control, if you will, and the maintenance. And so that's what we're dealing with right now. So we need to get okay. much better. Um, Phil, Phil, we're running a little low on time. I'm going to squeeze in one last question, nevertheless. Okay. The IRA the IRA provided uh, five billion dollars over five years for the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure uh, Nationwide Charging Network. But the legislation left the decision on how it gets deployed uh, to each state. So what's happening with that? Uh, are states making decisions? Are they getting chargers out there? Are they going to be able to manage getting the transmission and distribution system upgrades they're going to need to they're going to going to be needed to support that network? And now that'll be our last question. Uh, but I'd like to get just uh, a few words on how okay. we're doing with that. I'm really worried about the grid infrastructure issues because we're not moving quickly enough and we don't have good load forecasting. And so there's a real there's a real pain point here in the future. And so we are going to have to change both the regulatory paradigm a bit to allow proactive infrastructure investment, building ahead of need or you know ahead of time. We're gonna have to uh, come up with better load forecasts so yeah, this is a really important issue and we're behind the curve. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, that's, uh, that's a really uh, important topic that people don't realize. If we're gonna have electric cars, we're gonna have to have an electric grid to serve the electric cars. And that is, has enormous implications, uh, but we're gonna have to save that for another day, Phil. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, folks who have come to the uh, USEA Power Sector Podcast uh, for taking a chance and taking a look. And I want to tell you to go and tell everybody you know about our quest for finding solutions for the uh, energy transition. Thank you, Phil. That does it. Thank you, Herman. Thanks to all my friends at USEA.